bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening for this reflection on the nature of thinking, the benefits of this ability, the difficulties that it quite often poses for us, and ways in which we can become more skilled at using our thoughts in order to achieve a better quality of life, which is the goal and aspiration that nearly every living creature has, that is, to achieve happiness and fulfillment. As human beings, we are indeed highly evolved in the realm of thinking about. It is something in which we have been trained since childhood for millennia. And children go to school to learn basically how to think, how to think, how to analyze, how to project, how to imagine, how to create. And thinking is a tool that can be of extreme benefit and provide great opportunities for us. At the same time, this tool, like every other tool, can also become a nuisance and be used in ways which are rather harmful and bring about great results that are not very, very conducive to our well-being or to the well-being of others. Now, as most of you know, in Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings which I am um, versed in, there is a great emphasis put on the role of the mind and the importance that the mind plays in determining the quality of life. The very first two verses in the Dhammapada, which is a classic scripture of, in Buddhism, it is said that the mind is the forerunner of all good and bad things. Whatever the mind initiates, that is what will be generated and created. And that applies to the ability of thought and the capacity to create through thinking. Now, often uh, in, in the West, we have this idea that the Buddhist teachings can solve all problems. And this is true for um, many people who become interested in Buddhism. It is because of an interest in meditation, cultivating the ability of training the mind through systematic techniques, in the hope of achieving peace, at the very least, and possibly something even greater, insight, enlightenment. Uh, however, I do want to begin this evening by making one important point, and that is that the Buddhist teachings, which include many of the things that I will be sharing with you this evening, are really meant for addressing the normal state of the mind. In other words, the ordinary states of mind that ordinary people experience in life. They are very applicable, practical, and useful in order for us to lift and raise, elevate our consciousness, our mental capacity to more refined levels than the ordinary states of consciousness and the ordinary experiences that we have in normal, ordinary life. The Buddhist teachings were never really designed or meant to address the problems that some humans, I think throughout the ages and certainly today, may experience in the form of mental disorders or in very difficult mental and emotional states that actually make it very difficult for them to function in normal life. 
Today we may call these mental disorders or mental health problems. So the Buddhist teachings were really not intended for that purpose. And I, from my own experience, I know that this was a, a painful lesson for me to learn in my teaching career when I was a Buddhist monk. Because I thought that the Buddhist teachings and mind training and meditation in particular would solve all problems. And I did encounter some young people who would come to the monastery because it was an exotic place and they were interested. But they, some of these young people brought with them some quite complicated and severe mental issues, emotional issues that in actual fact could not be addressed by the type of meditation or the teachings that I could give them. And sometimes it even made it worse. And so I humbly suggest to you that we consider this. Whatever I share with you this evening or whatever Buddhist teachings you may acquire from other sources, try to remember that these were not meant to be a substitute for psychology, psychiatry, therapy, treatments from specialists who can address particular emotional and mental problems that require a special category of understanding. So with that caveat, let me say that the Buddhist teachings in general, and in particular the guidance that are provided in relation to living a better life, in relation to turning the attention inwards and becoming more familiar with our inner world, exploring the nature of the mind, how it works, learning skills of how to work with the mind in order to arrive at more refined states of peace, bliss and happiness, in order to arrive at a deeper understanding of the nature of reality. These teachings are valid, they are relevant, and they are very practical, and they are worthy of study. And so this evening what I want to do is to just encourage some reflection, um, contemplation on applying the teachings that were given by the Buddha in two particular discourses that dealt with thinking, this ability that we have to create in the mind. Now, for most uh, people who want to know about what to do with my thinking mind, the very first thing to recognize, and it's like a, a preliminary requisite, you cannot do anything until you have some experience, direct experience, some way of getting in touch with that which is not thinking. That is a very important realization, that there is more to you than thinking, that you are not the thinking. <laughs> the thinking is something that arises, that is generated, it's a creation of the mind. And as I said, it is a, can be a very useful tool, but it is not what you are. Now, for most people early on, I would say people who have very little spiritual inclination, they are pretty much lost in their thoughts and believe completely in their thoughts. They are their thoughts. There is no ability to reflect. There is no ability to recognize that which is not thinking. And it is sometimes a revelation when we can start to notice that thinking is something that we do, but not all the time, and there is a lot more to life than thinking. And we are still there in the sense of experience and being without the thinking taking place. 
And actually, the thinking is not even the most important thing in regards to our inner being or even our survival. You know, we think that uh, thinking is such a, uh, an important, so important, that is it's what enables us to survive. Ah, I don't think it's really that necessary. You can go for quite some time without thinking. If you have some stroke or something happens to your brain, and people have had this, uh, maybe you've heard of the book, My in, uh, Stroke of Insight, where the person actually you know, loses that capacity. This is the capacity of thought, but there's still a vibrant awareness. And actually, the experience of being alive is far greater. Now, we may not have access to such a radical experience, but just take this. What part of you is breathing? If you stop thinking, do you stop breathing? So, what is more important for life, breathing or thinking? I put it to you that if you stop thinking, but that part of the brain and the nervous system that controls this, this whole mechanism that allows for the inhalations and the exhalations to keep on going, you will remain alive. And I put it to you that if you lose that ability, even though you try to think as much as you want, you're going to die. <laughs> so this capacity and ability to think is something it is part of what we are, but it is not what we are. And I want you to get in touch with clarity, with full, full consciousness, to that which is not thinking, so that it will enable us to have that capacity to reflect and recognize thoughts for what they are. So what is it that's not thinking? This is one of the practices on, of nearly every meditation technique. We turn our attention to something that is not thinking. Say, the natural experience of the breath flowing in and flowing out. There is no way that you, the, that you can know this experience, this sensation, this sensory tactile experience through thinking. It is known through direct sense of touch. Just the same as the taste of honey. It does not matter how much you think about it, you're not going to know the taste of honey until you stop even for a, a microsecond. <laughs> stop that thinking about and taste, nor will you know the color of a flower, a rose, or the beauty of a sunset, or the beauty of classical music by sitting there thinking about it and analyzing, oh, this is, uh, uh, this is that color, and this is that uh, tone, and this is in high pitch and low pitch, and this is a rhythm. No, it's only in those moments when you stop the proliferation of the thinking process that the mind opens that new door of direct experience of seeing, direct experience of hearing, direct experience of smelling, direct experience of touching, and direct experience of tasting. So, this is a very good way for us to start to recognize that which is not thinking. Another way that you can possibly begin to do this is by thinking something intentionally. And when we do that, we think slowly. Like I say, my name is John Chian Josi. And I notice, I hear that, that is thinking, conceiving. But I also start to see the gaps between 
the silence before and the silence after each little bit of that thought process. And through these various, if you wish, careful noticing, we start to recognize that thinking is something which arises and ceases. It is not what we are. There is much more to life than thinking. <laughs> there is so much to life, so much to us, so much more than thinking about. So that's putting this whole world, the world of thought, into its perspective, its right perspective, that it's not what we are, it is not the only thing in life, it may not even be the most important thing in life. And the capacity and the ability to think does not necessarily in guarantee any degree of well-being and happiness or peace. And we know this because some people who are very gifted and very intellectually evolved are quite miserable. And uh, also we know from our own experience that thinking a lot doesn't necessarily uh, make us more happy. And that is why, in actual fact, these days, in this um, time of so much thinking, because I say this not because I can read people's minds, but because of what comes from all the thinking, which is all the social clutter of dialogue and conversations and talk and information through the various mediums of social media, entertainment, communications. These are all coming from originally thinking about, and that clutters the world out there. So now we feel quite oppressed by the amount of clutter in our information world, but this comes from the clutter of our own minds, to the extent that many people find it very difficult to just rest and relax and just chill, be peaceful, be calm. And at other times also, thinking itself becomes, you know, really oppressive because certain thoughts can be associated with emotion. Thoughts feed emotion. Emotions feed thoughts. This is not what comes first, the feeling or the thinking. Well, you know, it's, it, they're related. Feelings feed thoughts. Thoughts feed feelings. Feelings become emotions, the mental states. And so things like anxiety and anger and fear and remorse um, and the various paranoias that we can have about possible things that may happen in, to us or in life, these have become quite oppressive and debilitating to some extent. Now, before that happens, we'd like to have a better relationship with this tool, with this ability to think. So, in the two discourses given by the Buddha, the very first one that I'm going to refer to, both of these discourses are in the, what they call the middle length sayings. Um, these were a group of discourses that the Buddha gave during his life. The first one was uh, two types of thought. That's the kind of the title of the discourse, the two types of thought. And this is interesting because it re relates the Buddha, these discourses were supposedly spoken by the Buddha, memorized and then passed down through the ages. And now we have them in this Buddhist canon, which is a record of these teachings of the Buddha. And so this discourse is written and it's been translated in English. And it begins at one time, the Buddha was residing at such and such a place and he addressed the monks. And then it says, you know, a record of what the Buddha said. And in this discourse, the Buddha says, before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, 
That's the Pali term for bodhisattva, meaning one striving, still striving for enlightenment. While I was still a bodhisattva striving and resolute on enlightenment, I thought to myself, what if I classify thinking into two different groups? And he said, in one group, I will put the thoughts that are related to sensual craving, this preoccupation with sensory pleasures, materialism, just wanting more of sensual experience, material acquisition, the material world. Another one I'll put in here is thoughts of ill will. That is thoughts associated with aversion and anger, resentment and hatred and impatience. All those thoughts are, we classify as ill will. And another one I'll put in here is thoughts of cruelty, to hurt, to cause harm to others, to be a heavy burden on this planet. Those thoughts I'll put on one side and call them the unskillful, the unwholesome, the unhelpful <laughs> thoughts. And the other side, I will put thoughts that are associated with renunciation. And this is a word of, you know, you could say, the sense of having enough. I've got enough. I'm contented. I'm not so preoccupied with getting more and more pleasure of the, in the material realm, in the material world, Be getting more money, getting more wonderful sensory stimulations. I, I'm quite contented. I, I've got enough. <laughs> I'm quite contented. So this, the idea of turning away from the preoccupation with trying to find fulfillment from the sensory material world, because one is turning towards something more important, inner happiness, the happiness that comes from within, from spiritual cultivation. So that's the thoughts associated with that. I will put on this side as helpful thoughts. And thoughts that are associated with goodwill or loving kindness, friendliness, this sense of goodwill towards all others. And these thoughts I will put on this side as being helpful. And thoughts associated with harmlessness, not causing any harm to anything, anyone. Thoughts associated with kindness and compassion towards all living beings. I'll put these thoughts on this side as being he classified them as helpful or wholesome. Now, this is interesting because obviously he was not enlightened yet. He said so. However, he had been striving for quite some time as a recluse and devoted to a practice of self-restraint and discipline, living a life of austerity, purity in conduct and speech, and so now he was able to start really noticing what was going on in the mind, that which is the source of everything else. And he wanted to really refine this area of being, the mind. And this is an important point because uh, often, once again, in the Western world, when people undertake a spiritual practice or meditation or, you know, think, oh, well, yes, I want to become enlightened. I want to purify my mind. Uh, it's maybe a little premature because they've done no basic <laughs> foundational training. If one's life is still a mess, if one's life is still full of conflict and uh, just all sorts of problems, coming from relationships or conflicts with others or problems with health and problems with the government and problems with living. 
it's going to be very, very difficult for one to develop this degree of refinement to work on the level of the mind. And that is why in most spiritual traditions, including Buddhism, we say that a foundation in morality, right livelihood, right living, is kind of necessary in order for meditation and the practice of introspection to really be somewhat possible and somewhat successful. And it is interesting that in Buddhism, that we make a very clear distinction between karma and what we call moral precepts. Every action we do intentionally, be it an action through body or an action through speech, speaking, or an action through thought, that is an act, thinking is something we do, any of these doorways through which we act intentionally creates karma. However, of all the precepts that the Buddha laid down in terms of moral conduct for the lay community or for the monks and nuns, and the monks and nuns have hundreds and hundreds of rules that conform to a certain standard of conduct of body and speech. However, none of those precepts, none of those rules that are associated with the Buddha's training in morality can be broken by thinking alone. The moral precepts of lay people and those of the monastic community can be broken only through body action or speech action. The Buddha saw a big step up from establishing a life based on a moral code and then the purification of the mind in terms of its control of its thinking. And this always uh, interested me because I know that in the Christian tradition, one of the commandments is thou shalt not covet uh, your neighbor's wife or husband. And I'm thinking, boy, I don't believe there are any Christian people who can keep that commandment because most people have, they don't have the ability to control their minds. It is very, very difficult to really have that degree of refinement of control of the mind. You have to be very evolved. You have to be trained and disciplined. You have to have developed this skill, which I want to talk about further this evening. Most ordinary people don't have that. So inevitably, they have to confess that sin. <laughs> In Buddhism, the, the precept is, is to not commit adultery or improper sexual conduct. If you have improper mental thoughts about any of this area, you're creating karma. And you will re reap the results of that karma. But that is not breaking a precept. And so this training of the mind in terms of understanding the nature of thinking, beginning to have some control through understanding on the use of thoughts is a higher training. It does require a good foundation of stability and a life that is in quite good harmony so that you can devote some time to the process of introspection and the process of meditation, which is the introspection, getting to know what's going on in the mind, beginning to free the mind some, from some of its negative tendencies, negative habits, and beginning to experience the peace and the fruit that comes from that freeing of the mind. So coming back to this discourse of the Buddha, he had place these thoughts into two, these two categories, which meant that he obviously could 
have that capacity, to, sufficient capacity to reflect, to notice what thoughts were arising in the mind, and to not only notice them in an equanimous and indifferent way, but actually to understand whether they would be useful or not for one's goal. And his goal was to achieve happiness and enlightenment. And so he recognized that the thoughts that were associated with what he classified the unskillful or the unwholesome, the ones associated with this greediness for sensual pleasure, ill will, and cruelty, those thoughts he understood were not very conducive to cultivating peace, happiness, purity of mind. Having seen that, he also saw that the other thoughts that were associated with renunciation, the sense of saying, I've got enough and contentment, that is an incredibly powerful, if you wish to call it a thought or an attitude, that is an incredibly powerful state because it enables you to relax, be present, be peaceful, and meditate <laughs> and really be, con you know, this is a pre prerequisite almost to the ability to come within, is that you, you're willing to let go of the external distractions and preoccupations and the acquiring of stuff from the world out there. So this is a very helpful attitude of, ah, I've got enough, thank you. A and putting aside thoughts of, ill will, because that's the other one, is chasing and fighting. Chasing and fighting in the world. Trying to make the world and get what you can from the world just in your own image, or trying to get rid of it because it's not what you want. And that preoccupation always takes you out there. And because you're going out there, you can't come in and experience the deeper levels of meditation. Thoughts of cruelty, of course, are, you know, they, they really degrade, just degrade consciousness, make you insensitive. You become so insensitive that you revert to something very base and there is very little opportunity to, to really grow in compassion, in love, in sensitivity. Anyone who is accustomed to cruelty and comfortable with cruelty is becoming a dead person, just a, 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 is an, unable to really ever be truly human. Because here the Buddha said a very important thing. Whatever one thinks and ponders, that will become the mind's habit or inclination. Whatever one thinks about often, ponders on often, that will become our inclination, our habit. And that's what we'll keep on thinking about. And we all know this because if you start noticing the thoughts that come into your mind, you will recognize them because they come, they're of a similar type. Thoughts are conditioned. And one of the strongest conditioning is the, ha the habit, the habitual tendencies. If you think thoughts of ill will and think it over and over again, you're going to be an angry person. <laughs> you're going to become habituated to thinking negative, angry thoughts, and that's all there is to it. If we think thoughts of wanting and desiring and getting more and feed that, that's what thoughts of craving keep on getting stronger. And of course, it's not only that you generate these things. A lot of our thoughts are you know, we're victims of our environment and triggers that come in stimulate certain patterns of thoughts. And in our um, materialistic society, 
consumer-based society, we are trained to consume and trained to want ever more and more stuff out there. <laughs> So these thoughts arise, you know, it's like Christmas, oh, I've got to go shopping, got to buy. Why? Do you need it? No, no but I, you have an inner need urge <laughs> that is not related to your actual need. It's a wanting that's conditioned. Whatever we think and ponder often becomes the inclination of our mind, the habit patterns of our mind. It becomes our personality, what we're like, which is frightening, unless we start to pull back and take charge here. What is it that we are thinking about? What is it that we are dwelling on f f using this tool, using this capacity to generate thinking? to create concepts and thought structures about ourselves, about the world, about the past, about the future, about others. What is it that we are generating? And again, this is only possible if we have some direct experience of what is not thinking. You can pull back and reflect what is happening in the mind as a thought process rather than being that thinking, stuck to it, <laughs> and that's what you are. And when we're stuck to it, there is no possibility of any reflection or even any way of learning from it or changing it. So the ability to recognize through direct experience that which is not thinking is fundamental. And now we reflect on the thoughts that arise in the mind. And we begin by noticing the thoughts that are problematic. In other words, it's like you're driving along and you're not really paying much attention, but there's a red light and you, oh, red light, stop. <laughs> and, you know, Think, thinking is so fast, there's so much thinking. We are habituated to thinking that it's difficult for us to have the degree of clarity and reflective capacity to really recognize you know, what thoughts are happening. However, we do notice when there is, you know, something's not quite right, meaning that some thought preoccupation is creating a problem for us, either a feeling of discomfort, a feeling of not being at ease, uh, or conflict within our relationships. We know that th something is off. So let me just finish with referencing that one discourse first. The Buddha classified his thinking into these two groups, and then he said, I. Uh, I established myself in striving, mindfulness, and with resolve. Whenever thoughts that were unskillful arose in me, I understood that these were not helpful. These were, would bring harm and pain to myself and others, and these did not lead towards enlightenment. So I abandoned them. Whenever I saw thoughts that were associated with contentment and loving kindness and compassion, I realized that these thoughts were good and wholesome and they were conducive to well-being for myself and for others. And so, yeah, there's no harm in these thoughts. Um, it's, they're good. It's good to use them. It's a good tool. However, then he said one more really important thing. He said, however, even though these thoughts are good, you know, thoughts of re renunciation, contentment, loving kindness, compassion, these are all good things. However, if I just think about this all the time, <laughs> I'm going to get tired. My mind is going to become cluttered. And that is not conducive to inner peace and stability or insight. 
And so recognizing this, I said, there's a time for thinking and then there's a time for not thinking. And so he directed his mind towards stilling, completely stilling the thinking process to arrive at deep states of meditation, deep states of stillness and silence from which there could arise a penetrating insight, which was his enlightenment the realization of things as they really are, which is not something you do by thinking about it. So the point here is that even good thinking, useful thinking, positive thinking, eh, has its limitations. There's a time and place for it. It's like walking. You don't want to walk forever and ever, even though walking is good exercise. Sometimes you've got to sit down and rest. And so... In this discourse, the Buddha, at the end of it, you know, having explained these two types of thoughts, having abandoned one type of thought, seen the benefit of the other, but also the limitation of, cultivated deep states of meditation. Train the mind to experience deep states of stillness and silence, because it is through that direct experience of reality that frees the mind. And that direct experience of reality is not possible through the thinking mind. It's possible through the penetrating insight that arises from a mind that is very, very powerfully still and silent and clear. Powerful mindfulness, powerful insight. Now, that was one discourse. In the second discourse, uh, it's kind of a follow-up to that in that he gives a little more information about how we may deal with problematic thoughts. In this first discourse that I've mentioned, the Buddha basically just says to see the disadvantage, the harm in certain thoughts so that you can let them go. In this other discourse, he gives a few more aids to how to work with distracting thoughts, thoughts that are creating a problem for you. Now, this discourse was primarily directed to be applied or intended to be applied for people striving in meditation. But I think it refers to our ordinary life experience as well. When we have thoughts that are oppressing us, when we are pondering in ways that feels oppressive to us and creates problems for us, what are you going to do? What do you do? Of course, the first thing is to know what's not thinking so you can reflect. You can see this is a thought, this is a preoccupation, this is a something that is happening in the mind. It is the weather, <laughs> the weather of the day in the mind. Maybe it's a stormy day. So it's a stormy day, meaning maybe the mind is really very resentful and, and you know, really resentful and kind of angry about something or someone. And that's eating away at you. So you'd say that's a kind of a, not a very helpful thought. <laughs> and other times maybe the mind can be very preoccupied with worrying about what's going to happen. I have to go for this physical uh, exam tomorrow. Maybe they'll find something. And so you start worrying about that. And that's oppressive. So what did the Buddha suggest we do with regards these thought patterns, this preoccupation of the mind to dwell on thinking that is oppressive, not helpful to us, that is creating problems. First of all, he gives uh, quite a few <laughs> remedies, and you know, I'm just going to go through them quickly. The first one he says is, well, if you notice that it's not a very good, helpful thought, you just replace it by a good thought. <laughs> Just replace it by a positive thought. 
Uh, and that's easier said than done, obviously. It's, it's not uh, that easy. <laughs> but sometimes it can work, you know. It's just a, a shift. It's just a shift of attitude. And it's like, um, so you're driving along the road uh, in your lane, and this guy, he's behind you, and he's really, uh, he wants to get past you, and he turns around, passes you, and then cuts in front of you again. And yeah, it's quite unpleasant when people do that. And it's easy to get irritated and say, what the, why are you, you reckless maniac? So you could start getting quite irritated. Uh, how can you replace that <laughs> irritation in a way that would eliminate it? Uh, well, I, you know, it's a very good reflection. What about if you say to yourself, well, maybe that guy has just heard that his son is in, in the hospital uh, and in a critical condition, and he's just, you know, he has to get there to see his son. Yeah, go for it. I'm sorry I got in your way. All of a sudden, your attitude changes because you, you can understand there may be a good reason why that person is doing that. Now, you don't know why he's doing it, but by opening the mind to all possibilities, including a rational possibility, your irritation subsides. And in the same way, people are what they are. In that moment, they, most, we're just what we are. We can't be something else. We've all got failings and we've all got shortcomings and we're all not enlightened. So we should cut some slack. So just reminding ourselves of that. Sometimes it helps to just loosen that very uh, demanding attitude of the mind that often generates impatience, ill will uh, and resentment. And so that's an example of how we could just change a, a negative thought to one of patience and compassion. If that doesn't work, you know, if, uh, the Buddha said, well, contemplate um, the harm that uh, you're causing by dwelling on these thoughts, the pain that comes from it. And this is very easy to do, <laughs> actually. Uh, like, you know, thoughts of anger. Who's the first one who, who's getting hurt? The person who's getting angry. You know, when, even when we have every right to be angry, being angry uh, is unpleasant. When we're enraged with uh, irritation, resentment, ill will, this, this dissatisfaction with something, someone, the way things are, this striking out, uh, and then we justify it to ourselves. We can always justify every irritation we have. I can justify every anger I have. <laughs> uh, but justifying it, just saying, you see, I've got a right to be miserable. Because being angry, being irritable, being, uh, you know, with dwelling in hatred is miserable. If you look at yourself, your heart, your, how you feel within you, you're miserable. When you're angry, nothing is lovely. You look at the flowers, they're not lovely. <laughs> you eat a plate of food, it's not delicious. You lay down on a comfortable bed, you can't sleep. You're too angry. <laughs> if we contemplate on the disadvantages of these negative thoughts, these thoughts that oppress us or make us make problems in our lives. Now, I'm here uh, focusing on negative thoughts like anger and irritation because it's a lot easier. But also thoughts of, you know, desire and wanting. See wanting, see craving as not your friend. See it as a, a you know, it's like a, a cancer. It's always preventing you from being happy. Craving is always preventing us from being happy because it's always wanting something else. 
And as long as we want something else, we can't appreciate what we've got. And we don't notice what we've got. And we can't be happy even when things are really good. So notice the disadvantage of allowing these thought patterns to have power over you. And when we see that they are harmful, we actually do have a, 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 you know, an ability to kind of let them go a bit, not, not be so infatuated with them, not give them so much power by feeding them, by reassuring them, by making them our allies. <laughs> now we say, no, nah, you're not my friend, buddy. Uh, no, thanks. Go and bark somewhere else, don't come up here. So this ability to recognize it for what it is, it's not useful. Seeing the disadvantage. You know, sometimes anger acts like a friend. Craving acts like a friend, as if it's making us really feel good. It's like, oh, I've got something to look forward to. I'm going to go to that wonderful restaurant and I'm going to eat terrific food, you know. It's making, it makes you feel good in a way, but in actual fact, <laughs> it's feeding the habit of always looking for something else, which diminishes your ability to appreciate the now. So that even when you go to that wonderful restaurant to eat that wonderful food, you won't be there. You'll be thinking of something else. And the same with thoughts of irritation and anger. They, they always, they're not our friends. They are our enemies that take away from our sense of well-being and contentment. Recognizing them and allowing ourselves to, you know, find seeing the harm in them, maybe we'll be less willing to believe and therefore keep thinking in that train of thought or dwelling in that way releasing it and turning to something else. The third way that the Buddha encourages, also that is very useful, is to just not, yeah, just not give it any attention, to turn away from those thoughts. And this is a skill that we can develop. Sometimes we intentionally say, nope, I'm going to put that aside. That's all. <laughs> it's not relevant now, I'm putting it aside. There's nothing I can do about it, I'm putting it aside. There's uh, nothing I can change about it, I'm putting it aside. It's just like turning your attention away. You know, people get so angry about politics and certain poli politicians and certain social media that's out there. Ah, no, there's nothing I can do about it, I'm putting it aside. <laughs> it's not helping me. I'm not going to get involved with it. When it's time that there's something for me to do, I'll do it. If it's time for me to vote, I'll vote. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing I can do. I understand my limitation. And I'm not going to let myself get riled up and disturbed and all fussed and angry and lose my cool and be unable to relax and be comfortable and be happy and be peaceful and meditate because of what I can't do anything about. So I turn my attention away from it. I don't, get in, I don't engage. This works really well, actually, and we need to learn this skill, especially in this day and age. So many of us are just bombarded by so much negative media and uh, negative information, and we feel this responsibility uh, compelled to engage. And when we engage, we, we of course, take in all of this material information that generates all these often negative, critical, disturbing thoughts and emotional states. Why? Is it serving a good purpose for you? I question it. I ask that you question it and maybe know when to turn away. I found I learned this lesson very early on in my monastic life. Uh, when I'd been a monk for two years, I was living in northeast Thailand with my teacher, Venerable Ajahn Chah, remote jungle, a small jungle. <laughs> uh, 
don't get the impression that we're being, we're being chased by tigers or anything. Uh, no, but it was, I was living there, I was learning to become, to be a monk, and it was a, a different lifestyle. My parents were very unhappy with me having ordained as a monk. They were in Australia. I was in Thailand. My parents are Italian, I'm Italian. They were traveling from Australia to go back to visit Italy, and they were going to stop in Bangkok to see me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was an extremely stressful thought to me because I knew they were very, very unhappy and would be terribly emotionally charged uh, to meet them. It would be, it was going to be something. And so, I knew this in advance, two or three months in advance, and my mind, you know, started to really think about this as, and all how, how terrible it was going to be and how, how I was going to deal with it. And then I just said, well, I'm just not going to think about this until I get there, <laughs> until the actual time that I, this happens, that I am at the airport in Bangkok and I'm meeting it. Until then, I don't know what's going to happen. Therefore, I'm just not going to think about it. And so I found that, of course, also living in that environment, it was easy to maintain a degree of mindfulness. I could just, you know, whenever that thought started to come up, oh, no, not now. It's not time yet. And so I was relieved of all that unnecessary anxiety or stress. So it is a skill that we, we can develop. Just turn your attention away from that which is not necessary, helpful, or beneficial, or not the right time. It's not the time to think about that. Put it aside. You can do this at night. People wake up at night, and usually if you wake up at night, the, you know, the mind starts running. Some people have a lot of difficulty with this because it's so hard once the mind starts running and you're at night, it's dark, and, and you can't stop thinking. And it's really good to remember, now is not the time <laughs> to be thinking about this very clearly and put it aside. Now is not the time to think about this. And what I find very helpful is to use a mantra at that time. It's just to replace everything else just with one thing. Uh, now is not the time to think about this. And it's, the mind settles down. Another uh, method, and I'm coming close to the end in case you're wondering whether this will ever end, Another method the Buddha recommended to relieve, to help relieve the oppressiveness of these troublesome, distracting thoughts is to sometimes you can't replace it. You can't, uh, even though you see the problem with it, you can't give it up and you can't ignore it. It's just really knocking at the door. It won't go away. It's really pounding there. I want to be heard. Uh, and, it, and then, maybe it's time for you to listen. And to listen in a way that gets to the source. Where is this coming from? What is the underlying fuel for this thinking, for this type of mental uh, activity? What is the underlying fuel for this emotion and this feeling and this thinking. And this is especially important for troublesome thoughts that recur, that are chronic, you may say. There is an underlying cause. And often this requires quite a lot of skill of introspection and, and you know, just going deeply within. And it's usually you tap into the not the discursive process, tap into the feeling, the feeling behind it, the emotion, the feeling behind it. What is this? Why is there? Where, what view is this coming from? What feeling 
is triggering this. There is some underlying reason. Now, this can be done by oneself as a practice of meditation. For many people who are not skilled in meditation, we call this like therapy. You go to see a therapist and various techniques that they employ in order to put you in touch with the underlying source of this whatever problem is oppressing the mind. And this is a very valid and appropriate approach, especially for people who have quite, you know, I'm talking about quite severe or major problem that's creating great difficulty in life. I think this is a skillful thing to do. In meditation, we can do it uh, for ourselves, but not necessarily for everything. But for some things, we can. I remember one example I'll give is, when I'd been a monk for five, six years, I started, you know, I was becoming finally comfortable being a monk. I'm not sure if it was four or five years. But I started to feel anxiety about, um, a kind of une uneasy. And I wasn't sure why, but I, I just felt kind of a feeling of fear. And an, or a fear of something, and I wasn't quite sure what. And so in my meditations, I really went deeply because it was something nagging me, nagging me, nagging me. And I, what is this? Why am I feeling, what is that I'm afraid of? And as I went deeply, I started, to, and I could hear this thought about me being a monk. Uh, you know, is this the right thing, me being a monk? And as I went deeply, I, you know, very clearly saw this deep, concern. <laughs> it was a concern of, well, I, I'm, now I'm 30, I, I could probably still leave and, you know, get on with my life. But if I stay as a monk, I wonder when I'm, you know, when I'm 60 or 65, whether I'll regret it. <laughs> so I, I was starting to have a fear that maybe if I stay as a monk, when I get to be 60 or 65, I'm going to regret it. <laughs> and so it was really kind of a revelation that that was my concern, that if, you know, now I, I could get out, but what about if I stay and then I regret it? And so when I saw that, I, I just came to terms. I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to feel like when I'm 60 or 65. Maybe I'll regret it, maybe I won't. I don't know. I accept that I don't know. And because I accept that I don't know, okay, I'm comfortable now. I make the choice for now. I don't make the choice for when I'm 65. And so many of our things that oppress us are rooted in some, in a basic flaw in our view, in our understanding that causes, uh, you know, some sort of internal concern, a feeling of fear, a feeling of, um, you know, because we're not comfortable with the unknown. So this process of introspection to get to the source of what is actually fueling this unpleasant and unhealthy and uncomfortable mental preoccupation can relieve, it relieves it, because now you know the source, you come to terms with it, it relieves it. It's like in therapy. The last method that the Buddha says you can use is willpower, and I don't recommend it, and uh, the description of it is that you crush the one thought with the, the mind, and you just press your tongue against your palate, and and grit your teeth and, and get rid of that thought. <laughs> and I don't think that's, I'm glad that's been saved till the end, but I would probably only use that for like, if a thought something like, I have to go out there and kill so-and-so. I really have to go out there and kill so Well, if nothing else works, just grit your teeth and get rid of it. <laughs> don't listen to it. So these are the, the five ways that the Buddha recommended 
of dealing with distracting thoughts. One is to replace it with a, a positive thought or something that counteracts, gets rid of that negative thought. The other one is to recognize the disadvantage, the harm it does for you and others, it's, that it's not useful so that it, it loses its power. The other one is to turn your attention away from it. Just learn to turn your attention away. We can turn our attention towards something. We can turn our attention away from something. That is part of the skill that comes from meditation. The other one is when appropriate, you have to do the work, get to the source. What is generating this problem? And the last one, if you ever need it, just use your will. But hopefully you won't have to do that because the other means will help us. And then the Buddha said, one who masters these ways of dealing with distracting thoughts becomes one who is a master of one's thinking. One can think what one wants and not think when one does not want to think. And thus, one becomes a fully liberated, enlightened being, free of all greed, hatred, and delusion. But to arrive at that, of course, is a, a long and difficult training. We can all start only from where we are now. And now we have this capacity to reflect on what thinking we are pondering and dwelling on. And if we can reflect it, we can begin to choose which we cultivate and which we abandon. Thank you so much for your attention this evening. I hope you found what I've shared with you to be of some value. And once again, if you wish to read these discourses of the Buddha, they are available. Just go on YouTube and the discourses on two types of thoughts and the discourse on removing distracting thoughts. Good night to you all. We hope you enjoyed that presentation and we invite you to join us again next Thursday when we will have Tess Whitehurst speaking on flowers as spiritual teachers. We hope you can join us and in the meantime, take care and be well.